full chapter of basic concepts of chemistry using my personal tricks. The first topic is matter, which is divided into pure substances and impure substances. We know that pure substances contain same type of particles. For example, consider iron sheet and sodium chloride. We can see that this iron sheet contain one type of particles. These all particles have same properties. So we say that iron sheet is a pure substance. Secondly, this sodium chloride also contain one type of particles. All the particles have same properties. So we say that sodium chloride is a pure substance. Here, let me teach you one exam question. Why elements and compounds are called pure substances? Well, the answer is simple. They both are made up of one type of particles. So we say that elements and compounds are pure substances. For example, like iron sheet, gold, sodium chloride, silver, etc. On the other hand, impure substances are those substances which contain different types of particles. For example, consider salt solution and salad. We can see that salt solution contains two types of particles. Secondly, they have different properties. So we say that salt solution is impure substance. On the other hand, we can see that in salad, there are more than two types of particles and these particles have different properties. So we also say that salad is impure substance. Here, let me teach you one another exam question. Why mixtures are called impure substances? Well, mixture are called impure substances because they are made up of different types of particles. Remember the name of these important mixtures like air, seawater, solutions, suspensions, colloids, and alloy-like steel, which are usually asked in MCQs. So remember about pure substances and impure substances. The second topic is properties of matter, like physical properties and chemical properties. We can easily observe physical properties without changing the identity of a substance. Now how we can remember the physical properties of matter? Well, I always use my personal trick. Moving when should come late. Here, M stands for mass, V stands for volume, S stands for shape, C stands for color, L stands for length. Also remember that all physical changes like melting point, boiling point, evaporation, sublimation and condensation are physical properties. We can observe chemical properties when a substance changes its state. Now how can we remember chemical properties? Well, we say that moving when should come late. In case of chemical property, we say that Amir Bai will come. Here, A stands for acid, this A stands for air, B stands for base, W stands for water, C stands for chemical. So a reaction of acid, reaction of air, reaction of base, reaction of water and reaction of chemicals all possesses chemical properties. Thus noted down physical properties and chemical properties. Now let me teach you the third topic, physical quantities. Well, anything which we can measure is called physical quantity. For example, consider 12 km or 12 hours. Here, we can measure the length of anything like 12 km, so length is a physical quantity. Similarly, we can also measure the time like 12 hours. So time is a physical quantity. This topic is divided into three subtopics like base physical quantities, derived physical quantities, international system of units. Now what are base physical quantities? Well, the seven physical quantities in terms of which other physical quantities are expressed are called base physical quantities like length, time. Secondly, those physical quantities which we can derive from the base physical quantities are called derived physical quantities. For example, when we divide length by time, we get speed. Here, we know that length and time 
they both are base physical quantities but dividing them we get another physical quantity like speed which is known as derived physical quantity now what is international system of units well in 1960 an international system of units were established for seven base physical quantities which we call international system of units now how to remember base physical quantities and international system of units well i always use my personal trick i say lisa mem turns to a left edge here l stands for length m stands for mass t stands for time this t stands for temperature s stands for amount of substance l stands for light intensity e stands for electric current the sa unit of length is meter the sa unit of mass is kg the sa unit of time is second the sa unit of temperature is kelvin the sa unit of amount of substance is mole the sa unit of light intensity is candela and the sa unit of electric current is ampere remember that except these all seven units the rest of units are called derived units also let me teach you one bonus question what is the difference between mass and weight well mass is the amount of matter present in any object while weight is the force between the earth and an object the sa unit of mass is kg and the sa unit of weight is newton so note it down all these important points now coming to the fourth topic the fourth topic is about prefixes a mnemonic that is added to units to show multiples or fractions are called prefixes for example consider 2 kg here gram is the unit and kilo is the prefix now how can we remember the list of important prefixes well i use my personal trick i always write 10 to the power 1 2 3 and then i jump 3 times 6 9 12 now i say dad has kept my great trick this d stands for deca this h stands for hecto this k stands for kilo this m stands for mega this g stands for giga and this t stands for tera secondly i write 10 to the power negative 1 then i write negative 2 negative 3 and then i repeat the previous process jumping 3 times negative 6 negative 9 negative 12 i use the trick that can make me nice person here this d stands for deci this c stands for centi this m stands for milli this m stands for micro this n stands for nano this p stands for pico so this is the list of negative prefixes thus using this trick we can easily learn all the prefixes the fifth topic is scientific notations well a system of writing two big or two small numbers to save space and time is called scientific notation for example round about the mass of the earth is 6 into 10 to the power 24 kg we can see that it is a very big number so using scientific notation we can easily save space and time to write it also the diameter of the nucleus is 1.7 into 10 to the power minus 15 meter it is a very small number so using scientific notation we can easily save space and time to write it the seventh topic is significant figures the certain are sure and important digits in any measurement are called significant figures for example consider this number here we know that 205 are certain are important three digits while this 003 is uncertain less important three digits so the collection of certain are less important digits are called significant figures now let me teach you the most simple trick to find significant figures i write non decimal numbers and decimal numbers in case of non decimal numbers go from non zero digit to last non zero digit for example consider this number here the first non zero digit is 1 and the last non zero digit is 2 so i go from this one to this two now i count the total digits in this number 
There are six digits in this number, so there are six significant figures. Similarly, consider this number. The first non-zero digit is four, and the last non-zero digit is five. I go from four to five. So there are three digits. I say there are three significant figures. Thirdly, consider this number. Here, the first non-zero digit is one, and the last non-zero digit is three. So I go from one to three. There are three digits. I say there are three significant figures. Now, in case of decimal numbers, I go from first non-zero digit to last digit. For example, consider this number. Here, the non-zero digit is two, and the last digit is zero. So I go from two to zero. We can see that there are three digits in this number. So there are three significant figures. Secondly, consider this number. The first non-zero digit is one. So I go from one to the last. There are four digits. So there are four significant figures. Thirdly, consider this number. The first non-zero digit is five. So I go from five to the last. There are total five digits. So I say there are five significant figures. Thus, using this simple trick, we can easily learn significant figures. The seventh topic is accuracy and precision. Accuracy means that how close you are to the actual value. For example, consider this man. That the height of this man is five meter. Let I ask three students to find the height of this man. Let the first student measured it as a four meter. The second student measured it as four point five meter, and the third student measured it as five meter. Now these are the three different measurement. We say that this whole measurement is accurate result, or we say that high accuracy because the one measurement is exactly five meter, which is matching the actual height of the man. So the actual measurement is also five meter. And this measurement of the student is also five meter. So they both are intersecting or touching each other. So we say that this measurement is accurate or it has high accuracy. On the other hand, precision means that how does two or more measurements are close to each other? For example, consider the man from the previous example. We know that the actual height of the man is five meter. Let I again ask three more students to find the height of this man. Let one student measure the height of this man as three point five meter. The second student also measured three point five meter, and the third student measured it as three point four meter. Now let me ask you: Are these three measurements are accurate? Your answer is no, because the actual measurement is five meter. And the measurements of the students are totally different from them. But wait a minute. Here we can see that this 3.5 and this 3.5 are close to each other, while this 3.5 and this 3.4 are also close to each other. The results of students are close to each other, so it has high precision. So we say that the first measurement of the student is close to the second measurement of the student. And the second measurement of the students is close to the third measurement of the students. So we say that it has high precision. Thus remember that it has high precision but low accuracy. Now let me teach you some important MCQs. A scale measure the mass of an apple as constantly as 0.5 kg less than the actual mass. The options are accurate and precise. Accurate and non-precise, precise but not accurate. Which one is right? Well, the C option is hundred percent right. Zero point five is precise because the scale is constantly measuring zero point five kg, zero point five kg, and zero point five kg. But this result is not accurate because it is less than the actual mass. The mass of a bag is ten point five kg. A student measured it as 12.5 kg, 10.6 kg, 9.5 kg. The options are precise but not accurate, accurate and precise, 
accurate and not precise. Can you guess the correct option? Well, the correct option is C. It is accurate because one measurement of the student is matching the actual measurement. On the other hand, it is not precise because 9.5 kg is very different from 10.6 kg. Thus, this is all about accuracy and precision. Remember that we will not discuss topics of 9 class which we have already learned like atomic masses, relative atomic masses, atomic mass unit, percentage composition, etc. So, the next important topic is dimensional analysis. The process of converting one set of units to another is called dimensional analysis. For example, convert 3045 meter to kilometer and 35 degree centigrade to Kelvin. We know that in one kilometer, there are 1000 meter. So, I divide 3045 meter by 1000. I get 3.45 kilometer. On the other hand, in 1 degree centigrade, there are 273 Kelvin. So, 35 plus 273 is equal to 308 Kelvin. Thus, this process of converting units from one set to another is called dimensional analysis. The ninth topic is laws of chemical combination. Well, there are five different laws or five subtopics that describe the basic rules by which atoms and molecules combine together. The first law is law of conservation of mass. Remember that it is all about the mass. It states that mass can neither be created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. For example, consider 2 grams of hydrogen and 16 grams of oxygen. When they both react together, they form water. Now, if we measure the mass of the water, it would also be 18 grams. So, we say that the mass of the reactants is 18 grams and the mass of the product is also 18 grams. Thus, they both are equal. That's why we say that mass can neither be created nor destroyed in any chemical reaction. The second law is law of definite proportion. Remember that it is based on ratio of masses. The word definite proportion means fixed amount. It states that chemical substances are made up of elements that are present in fixed ratio by mass. For example, consider water and hydrogen per oxide. In water, the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is 2 to 1, while in hydrogen peroxide, the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is 1 to 1. It shows that the ratio of oxygen and hydrogen would always be 2 to 1 in the water, while the ratio of hydrogen and oxygen in hydrogen peroxide would always be 1 to 1. Therefore, we say that chemical substances combine in fixed ratio by mass. The third law is law of multiple proportion. It is very difficult for students, but I will crack it. It is also based on ratio of mass. Now consider two elements like X and Y. Let they form three different compounds. XY, XY2, XY3. Now we can see that the ratio of X in all these three compounds is 1, while the ratio of Y in all these three compounds is 1, 2 and 3. Now listen carefully. We say that if y combine with the same element x, the ratio of y is whole number like 1, 2, 3. Let me repeat it. If y combine with the same element x, the ratio of y is the whole number like 1, 2, 3. This is what the law of multiple proportion explains. Let me give you one real example. Consider carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. In carbon monoxide, the ratio of masses is 12 to 16, while in carbon dioxide, the ratio of masses are 12 to 32. Now, dividing this whole thing by 12, in carbon monoxide, the ratio of carbon is 1 to 1.3, while in carbon dioxide, the ratio of carbon is 1 to 2. So, the ratio of carbon is 1 in both the compounds, but the ratio of oxygen is 1, 2 which is again whole number. Therefore, this law states that 
when two elements like x and y form two different compounds, the ratio of the mass of y can be expressed as whole numbers. So this is what the law of multiple proportion teaches. The fourth law is Gay-Lussac's law. Remember that it is based on volume of gases. It states that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. For example, consider oxygen gas in this cylinder. If we increase the temperature of the gas, the rate of collision of oxygen molecules on the wall of container is increased. As a result of this, pressure is increased. So we say that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. The fifth law is Avogadro's law. Remember that this law is based on volume and mass of a gas. It states that volume is directly proportional to number of moles or mass of the gas at constant temperature and pressure. For example, consider these balloons. As you fill these balloons with more air or more mass, their volume increases. Remember that we can also write Avogadro's law as equal volumes of any two gases at constant temperature and pressure contains the same number of moles or same masses. For example, consider 2 dm cube hydrogen gas and 2 dm cube of oxygen gas. Let they both are present at constant temperature and pressure. So we say that they both contain equal number of molecules. Thus noted down these laws of chemical combinations. The tenth topic is mole and Avogadro's number. In our daily life, we say that one dozen egg is equal to twelve. So we say that one dozen is nothing but just like a number. Now to learn the concept of mole and Avogadro's number, we should learn relative atomic mass and molar mass. For example, the relative atomic mass of carbon is 12 AMU. Remember that there is only one atom of carbon present. Now we cannot touch, we cannot see and we cannot do chemistry with one atom of carbon. To solve this issue, scientists put forward the idea of molar mass. Now instead of 12 AMU, if I take 12 grams of carbon, it is known as a molar mass. Remember that we can touch, we can see, we can do chemistry with molar mass of carbon. We know that in 12 AMU, there is only one atom of carbon, but in 12 grams, there are total 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 atoms. Thus, this number is known as Avogadro's number. Thus, remember that in 12 grams of carbon, there are 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 atoms. Now listen carefully. One mole is always equal to molar mass of an atom, molecule or formula unit. Also we know that molar mass of any atom like carbon, molar mass of any molecule and molar mass of any formula unit contains 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 atoms. So remember that one dozen of anything is always equal to 12. One mole or molar mass of any atom, molecule or formula unit contains 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 particles. If you want to learn more about mole concept and Avogadro's number, we have already uploaded a very dedicated video and its link is given in the description. The last topic is molarity and molality. Now, molarity is the number of moles of solute dissolved in 1 liter solution. Remember that we do not consider solvent and molarity. For example, consider some water in this object. I add 2 moles sugar to this water. After adding 2 moles sugar to this water, the volume of solution becomes 1 liter. So, we say that the solute is sugar and we have dissolved 2 moles of it. The solvent is water. The volume of solution is 1 liter. So the molarity of this solution is 2m because we have dissolved 2 moles of sugar in 1 liter. Remember that the formula of molarity is number of moles of solute upon volume of solution. On the other hand, molality is the number of moles of solute dissolved in 1 kg of solvent. Remember that 
we do consider solvent in case of molality. For example, firstly, I take 1 kg of water in this object. Now let consider that I add 4 mole of sugar to this 1 kg of water. Now we know that the solute is sugar and we have dissolved 4 moles of it. The solvent is water and the mass of the solvent is 1 kg. So the molality of this solution is 4 m because we have dissolved 4 moles of sugar in 1 kg of solvent. Remember that molality is denoted by small m and it is equal to number of solute upon mass of the solvent n kg. I hope that you have learned the important concepts of first chapter of chemistry.